Hello, I'm Julie Swenson, Managing Director of Forward Theater Company in Madison, Wisconsin. And this is Theater Forward, a twice monthly conversation about theater from a local, regional, and national perspective. From Madison to Manhattan, we are excited to share insight into our own company while exploring issues surrounding theater in the Midwest and around the country. Welcome to episode 48 of Theater Forward. This week's conversation is with Christy Childs Twilly. He is a professional pianist, music director, composer, and sound designer. And we are fortunate enough to be working with Christy on our production of The Niceties. Welcome, Christy. It's so nice to have you here. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Well, this is the first time that we have um, played together uh, here at Forward. So. Um, tell me a little bit about your history and, and all of these titles that I just, uh, I just enumerated. <laughs> sure, sure. So uh, my background is actually in piano. I, I started off as a concert pianist. And when I moved to Chicago in uh, 2007, started migrating into the musical theater field and eventually into composing for straight plays and that turned into composing for film and sound designing. So it's been a big evolutionary process. Uh huh. And where, where'd you go to school? I went to West Virginia University. And is that where you're from originally? I am, I'm a mountain mama from West Virginia. <laughs> All right, <laughs> and so what, did you go right from West Virginia to Chicago or were there a whole bunch of places in between? Oh, no, there were many places in between. Um, I went to Ohio first. Um, I lived in Ohio for nine years and worked for a music school and an arts marketing firm there, um, in addition to playing and teaching. And then after I married, I moved to Little Rock, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, was continuing to play and manage a music school there. And then I came to Chicago. And how long have you been in Chicago? Let's see, it's been 13, going on 14 years now. Great, great. So the process of going from um, a pianist to a sound designer, how, how did that work? What was the evolution of that? Well, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that classical pianists and classical musicians in general are always asked to visualize other instruments when they play. Um, it's a way that helps us to interpret sound quality and timbre and expression um, to create more variation in our music. And in addition to that, we're also asked to, to sort of develop a story around what's happening that plays through our mind um, as we're, we're performing. And so with all of that, and then taking into consideration our work with orchestras and chamber ensembles and different instruments, you quickly and very naturally uh, come to associate yourself with how certain instruments are helpful in arranging or are helpful in um, determining a character, a mood, uh, a persona, that type of thing. And so actually navigating into composition for theater seems pretty natural coming from, from that background. And the musical theater aspect of it, um, I've at this point music directed and conducted about 40 shows. So the aspect of dealing with all of that texture, right? And storytelling through song only amplifies that other background. Right. Um, and so as far as the sound design goes, you know, I've always been a very, very into technical things. So um, amplification, projection of sound was always interesting to me, but it was also interesting to create worlds. Um, and so, uh, you know, I just started exploring programs and writing in those ways too. things that aren't always melodic, but are atmospheric. And yeah, I got, I got pretty hooked. 
that's fantastic. And I and I didn't know that about um, classical um, pianists, but that certainly that makes a lot of sense. And and can I say, you say pianist, I say pianist. Tell me, am I saying it wrong? I know oh, everybody <laughs> so, probably asked that, but let's you know no. let's let's educate our listeners, Christy. Well, I mean, we as hoity-toity classical pianists would say pianist, but pianist is fine. It's it's. I think it's a regional thing. The, uh-huh. only, the only thing that makes me cringe a little bit is when someone hears me play and they call me a piano player. <laughs> that one kind of gets to me. <laughs> pianist or pianist, we're okay, but piano player, no. Got it. <laughs> I mean, it's true, but... <laughs> Getting back to, because we're working with you, obviously, as a composer and sound designer. So what was what was the transition? I mean, I understand um, how much of your education sort of naturally flowed to that position. But what was the show or what was the position where you said, I'll try this sound design thing for for a for a play for the stage? You know, it's really interesting. Um, it was something that other people were really deciding for me based on other things that I had written. Um, I would say that it probably came from moving from Yellow Man, uh, which I did with Fleetwood Jordan Theater, mm-hmm. into a production that they did in collaboration with Piven Theater called A Home on the Lake which was based historically on events that happened in Evanston, Illinois here, um, close to Chicago, um, with some changes to the historical context. And so that's when they said, would you sound design this instead? And because I was very familiar with those spaces and had already in other instances been t- had been talking to them about amplification and speaker placement and all these other things. The other aspects of the, of the design actually were not as difficult. Like for instance, I had already subscribed to an international sound database and I was already using programs like Ableton and and logic for other purposes. So now to mix and blend those sounds was, was not uh, difficult for me, so for me, it became really interesting once they said, do you think you can create a soundscape that sounds like they're getting ready to move a house in the 1920s? <laughs> sure, let me go in, in all of my urgency and geekdom and go and research that because I, I love looking for those sort of details um, to see what machinery was used, what we would have heard, what the truck sounded like, like every aspect of it. Um, then, you know, can you build us a soundscape of, of the lake at this time of year, lapping against rocks? Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Can you build us a garden at nighttime? Oh, yeah. So that's that's how the tr- transition happened. I mean, I'm like I said, we're already imagining so many of those worlds anyway. Uh, when we're performing other music. So it was fun to build them. That's fantastic. What What is your process? I mean, that's, people have said we need, we need the sound of a house <laughs> being moved. But what, you know, uh, certainly you have conversations with the directors and, and here's the idea we're going towards. But what's your process? You get a play and and how do you go through it and determine what the sound design will be? Usually I like to just sit down and read through it. And I have a little notebook that's called ideas. And as I'm reading the script, I'm just starting to jot down notes about uh, how I think certain characters feel, how I think their environment feels. Um, And then I start to detail points of conflict and different emotion emotions that they're going through along with locations. And I start to consider, well, if we're in the same place, then how does this world have to physically, what has to happen atmospherically to make it feel like a change is occurring um, versus just being in a new place. And then after I finish that process, I'll set up a meeting with the directors 
And I'll ask them, you know, were there, was there anything specific that you already had in mind or that comes to mind uh, and you know that you want? And either they'll share that with me immediately or they'll say, no, 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 we want to hear your ideas first. And so then I start to present all of those ideas that I was writing down uh, as as I was reading the play. And sometimes I'll read it seven, several times through. It really depends on the context of, of the play and in some cases how hard it is. Right. Well, this is a, a little bit insider trading, um, but uh, at our first rehearsal for the niceties, you said that you had several choices for Zoe, uh, Zoe's entrance, I believe it was, and you needed to hear the actor, needed to hear the actor, then that would determine which, which uh, choice you were going to make. What were you looking for? That is absolutely true. So first readings inform me so much. Uh, I feel like before I can orchestrate something, um, <clears throat> I need to see and hear the people first because um, I want it to be attached to them and what we're seeing, not just the words of a play that maybe several people have read. Um uh -huh. And so with Zoe, um, this is actually the exit, the end of the music that's used at the end of the play. Um, we, we now needed to see a glimpse of her and her perspective and her world and how she was emerging out of that. And so I said, well, depending on what our Zoe looks and sounds like, you know, that could be a number of things. And so we knew we wanted it to be something modern we knew we wanted it to sound hip hop ish um, and, and current with like college life. And so I built four different samples for her, four different beats for her. And then when I heard her and I, and I saw her, then it was easy for me to narrow it down and say, well, I think it's one of these two. And then the way she handled the end of the play said, you know, it's this. One. This one tells me this is how Zoe is going into the world. So each one of those had had a very different character to them. Each one of them had different types of synth patches and beats. There were some that were lighter and more easygoing. There were some that were more hardcore. And, you know, so I just found the balance of the two in between. considerations are fascinating. I, I love to hear all of that. I'd love to sit in a room and just um, watch, watch you um, create. Um, and, and speaking of which, uh, so we have been creating on computers um, and, and doing virtual productions for the last nine months. I know you've done a tremendous amount of them. Um, how does your work differ in the world of virtual theater versus live theater? Oh, wow. It's so different. And it, it really depends on if 
the company is filming or live streaming mm-hmm. um, or doing only like a radio type play. Um, in general, I would say that navigating the sound in a live stream has proved to be really challenging. Um, and, and that's because of delays. Um, it can also be because of the platforms and they're not picking up all of the frequencies um, well enough. They're not translating through built-in computer speakers, right? right. Yeah. So I'm how the audience is experiencing all of the sound has really made me have to think about how can I overall make sure there's this consistent level of quality, regardless of whether they're wearing a great pair of headphones or AirPods that have a lower end to them or surround sound in their house because they're doing airplay on their television or whatever. Um, So trying to find the right balance of frequency and timbre that translates through the internet um, in many ways, playback, live streaming, only audio um, when we're not filming has, that's, that's been the greatest challenge. Right. And it's not, there's a lot of things you don't have control over. Is that right? I mean, some of the things that you talked about is if you're, if you're watching a show on your TV versus if you're watching your show, I don't know, on your iPhone, it's going to be very, very different. Absolutely. It's sort of similar to like if you're watching television and you have your television set on one volume and then a commercial comes on and all of a sudden the volume is like through the roof. Right. Right. Um, So trying to manage that is a lot more difficult. If we're doing some post-production for radio plays and film, it's, it's easier for us to balance that out. But when we're live streaming, it can be very hard to be very difficult to control over time. Absolutely. Is, is So we are doing film or, you know, we're not doing live streaming. Um, that just sounds like another level of difficulty I don't want to ever do. Um, is it easier? It's easier to control that. Obviously, the sound is consistent in, in different ways. Um, is your process different? Is your, I mean, the way that you look at a play, the way you consider things is that, do you make decisions based on, I know that people are not seeing this, listening to this live. This will be in post-production. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Yes, absolutely. There is, there is a big difference. And in particular, if I am also doing the sound design component, Mm -hmm. um, for me, we're now walking this very thin line between this is theater or is this film? And so on the post side, I try in the instances of film, um, I try to make sure that if we see things moving and it feels like we should hear them, that we do hear them. You know what I mean? That could be anything from someone picking up plates, saucers, setting them down, books sliding, how the fabric of clothes moves, chairs moving back. Because when you're just looking at something and there's no sound there, it it sort of breaks the world. Do you know what I mean? It makes it feel anti-dimensional. Like you can see what's happening, but it's it feels like it's no longer a three-dimensional type of space that they're in. It feels flat like the screen. Right. So definitely um, in those instances, I go back and try to add what it is that I think we're not feeling or experiencing yeah. that to, to make it seem more honest, if that makes sense. Yeah, and so then, you're actually adding more in a virtual production to to amplify the things we're not getting in a collective room, collective viewing. Exactly. So, for instance, huh. last summer when I worked on Stew. For the Milwaukee Black Theater Festival, um, you know, for that, everything that every that people heard when they're in this kitchen cooking was all things that I built. And it was all based on were they moving, ducking down in cabinets to pull things out? Were they turning burners on, you know, and, and their movements and all of that made it seem like the sound was actually being captured on a microphone. Um, 
you know, the dog barking in the distance, like how far away do I think this dog, this dog is, this incessant barking. Wow. <laughs> um, yeah, so there is a lot more to do um, in, in film. And, and with radio, for me, I think because I'm such an auditory person, it's, it's almost a little bit easier to, as I'm listening, to determine how to balance the sound, how to adjust the, the EQ or filters so that you can just enjoy the experience. There's, you know, there's more consistency uh, in level, I, found, I find, when we do the radio plays. Christy, this is fascinating. And I didn't think, honestly, that I would learn as much as I just have in, uh, you know, in the time that we have been together. Um, it's, you know, we're, we're just into our, our, um, beginning relationship and working together, but I certainly hope there are many, many, many more opportunities and maybe even an opportunity to work in person and see oh. another person <laughs> in the near future. Um, that would be wonderful. I'd love it. <laughs> thank you so, so much for joining me. And, and that's all for this episode of Theater Forward conversation about theater in Wisconsin in America. Thank you for joining us. I'm Julie Swenson, and our podcast is produced by Scott Hayden. You can follow us or share your thoughts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Theater Forward, as always with an ER. And if you enjoy this podcast, don't forget to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you might tune in, and be sure to leave a stellar review. We're grateful to have you listening and we'll be back soon for another theater forward conversation. <laughs>